My name is Jovana. I'm the new digital maintainer. And I would like to use this talk as an opportunity to introduce myself and my previous work to the trust community. Once again, I'm really thankful to Arb, Callum and Lena for trusting me with this role and inviting me here to give a talk. Um, my background is a bit chaotic, so um, bear with me. I will try to summarize some of the key projects that I worked on in the past. And the bulk of this talk um, will be focusing on my entry into the realm of primates, where I will share some of my recent uh, interests and uh, insights with you. So this talk is going to be a mixture of science, storytelling, cool monkeys, and um, insights that will hopefully spawn new ideas and formats here at Trust. My hope is to serve as a sort of medium between the scientific realms that I inhabited as an outsider and to offer this knowledge to you. So with this, we can dive in. My previous education has been quite nomadic and chaotic. I grew up in a small town in northern Serbia during a very strange time in Balkan history. I was debating uh, what would be the appropriate imagery to depict the vibe of my hometown. So I decided to show you our big blue brutalist hospital. Uh, isn't she pretty? Anyways, um, from Serbia, I moved directly to Shanghai in China, where I started my studies in neuroscience. What you see right here is a voltage trace of a neuron that I recorded in a mouse brain slice. I used a microscopic pipette to probe miniature currents inside a rapidly dying neuron that I kept alive in a dish with artificial cerebrospinal fluid. Collectively, these currents contribute to the electric machinery of the nervous system, forming large-scale ensembles and neural networks. This voltage trace is also an artifact, a remnant of a naive and perhaps masochistic time of devout worship and sacrifice for the stem altar. My personal hero at the time was Yuri Bushaki, a pioneer in the study of neural syntax, that is, how neural information is segmented and organized into different brain rhythms to support cognitive functions. The traditional empiricist method is to connect stimuli in the external world to their representations in the brain. Bushaki turned this approach upside down by emphasizing the importance of decoding the brain's innate vocabulary with or without stimuli. During this time that I will now refer to as the electrophysiology simping period or EPSP, I focused on studying brain dynamics with little consideration of the organism behind the brain. For example, during my undergraduate studies at NYU, I used EEG or electroencephalography to record and investigate brain waves associated with sound perception in humans with cochlear implants. You can see a sketch of the electrode montage I designed to capture this particular brain wave, as well as an example trace in the back. However, things changed once I started engaging with the brains of animals. During my master's at Humboldt University Berlin, I joined the lab of Michael Brecht, who is infamous for his unconventional approaches and taboo topics in neuroscience. Some of these include, for example, incest, cannibalism, genitalia innervation, etc. We also explored neural anatomy and behaviors of different animals. For example, elephants. What you can see on the left is an elephant skull that my boss randomly brought one day from the zoo. Also tadpoles, shrews, pigs, wild boars. 
It was here that I was first introduced to the field of neuroethology, the evolutionary and comparative approach to the study of animal behavior and its underlying neural mechanisms. In 1963, Nico Tienbergen laid out four central questions in the discipline. Causation, how does it work? Survival value, what is it for? Evolution, how did it evolve? And ontogeny, how does it develop? My first model organism of choice would then become the rat. Rats and other animals um, like bats, oops, do we see, okay, perfect. So rats and other animals like bats emit ultrasonic vocalizations at frequencies normally not detected by human ears. These vocalizations are produced in different social contexts, so recording and analyzing them presents a window for us to understand the animal's emotional and affective states. Interestingly, rats seem to really enjoy tickling and engage in playful behaviors both with other rats and also with humans. In my lab, we would tickle rats and record their calls with an ultrasonic microphone to try and listen to what they were saying. A peculiar signal came to our attention. These short chirps the rats would emit while playing seemed somewhat familiar. At a closer look, they resembled a form of proto-laughter or potentially an evolutionary predecessor of laughter in humans. So to investigate the neural origin of the signal, I would electrically stimulate the brains of rats under anesthesia and record whatever vocalization they would produce in response to this stimulation. What was really fascinating to me at the time was that I could directly observe the change in the behavior as a result of perturbing the brain. Even the tiniest of parameters like the stimulation current in microamps or a millimeter distance in the brain would have a totally different behavioral effect. As human researchers, we have the tendency to anthropomorphize these vocalizations and attribute meaning to them. Of course, it is hard to entirely eliminate our own subjectivity when exploring animal behavior, but this is where AI comes into play. The software you see here is called Deep Squeak. It is a deep learning based system for detecting and analyzing the calls of rodents. The software is one of many recent efforts in decoding animal linguistics using artificial intelligence. Despite the ever expanding methodological repertoire in neuroscience research, I started to develop serious concerns about the ecological validity of the behaviors explored. A common approach involves designing a task where an animal, most often a rodent, is trained to produce a response, such as press a lever or move their eyes to a set of stimuli. Typically, a task is designed to try to isolate a specific computation that an animal will repeat many times each day. The problem is that this is far removed from naturally observed behaviors. Animals evolved in complex environments, producing a wide range of behaviors like navigation, foraging, prey capture, and social interactions, which vary over time scales from milliseconds to days. Inferring insights about human cognition and behavior from rodent studies is therefore problematic as they occur in highly artificial environments. Sadly, I fell into a similar trap when I started my PhD. Story time. At the beginning of last year, I accepted an offer to study the navigational system of small laboratory primates. At the time, I was already contemplating the shortcomings of neuroscience and the rodent model to address the complexity of the questions it was trying to answer. Working with primates is considered to be the highest form of sacrifice a cognitive scientist can make 
as it's incredibly lengthy, difficult, and risky. The somewhat arrogant reasoning behind this is that because of their close resemblance to humans, your results would undoubtedly become more valid just by virtue of evolutionary proximity. This assumed a hierarchy of intelligence which programmed the brains of generations of neuroscientists, but emerging fields like neuroethology could be a much necessary revival focusing on non-human intelligence. What you see here on the left is a monkey caged shaped as an icosahedron. The idea of my supervisor was to explore primate navigation by putting monkeys in this Lovecraftian cage, rotating them around every axis while recording their brain activity with a wireless implant that I would surgically install into their brains. Their movements inside this cage would be tracked with motion capture cameras and the combination of all this data would paint a picture of how monkey and inadvertently humans navigate in physical space. Let us take a moment for a dramatic pause to respectfully appreciate this attempt. Okay, this didn't happen. <laughs> What happened instead was something entirely different. I quit. And this is the reason why. In order to successfully collaborate with the monkeys who would one day become sacrificed for this research, they had to be trained and accustomed to us first. I would spend every day with six of these small but incredibly intelligent primates called marmosets. In this video, you can see Dante and lead and receive a small reward with the goal of becoming comfortable and trusting me, their human caretaker. Unexpectedly, the bonds I developed with these monkeys grew so strong that I stopped caring so much about their brains and instead became obsessed with their behavior and personalities. Common marmosets are small neotropical primates endemic to northeast Brazil. They're highly active, living in the upper canopies of forest trees and feeding on insects, fruits, leaves, sap, and gum. The species has gathered interest recently as a model for neuroscience research. Much of this excitement has centered on their reproductive biology and compatibility with gene editing techniques, paving the path for transgenic marmosets to study disease and basic brain mechanisms. These primates exhibit remarkable cognitive and problem-solving skills, both in captivity and in nature. For example, they can learn motor skills from observing the actions of other individuals. They can easily learn how to use touch screens and manipulate objects to forage or to solve a task. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of marmosets is their social and emotional intelligence. These monkeys live in small groups and interact socially in many ways. Both parents and other members of the group rear offspring cooperatively and teach their ways to the young. When marmosets gaze at others or objects, they frequently tilt their head. This direct gaze is rare in the primate kingdom where prolonged eye contact is often considered a threat. Marmosets, on the other hand, seek out eye contact, even with people. Humans and marmosets are one of the only primates with a family unit. The rearing system is correlated with proactive pro-sociality, which can be expressed as a motivation to share information. It is believed that the unique coincidence of these two components in humans set the stage for the evolution of language. Together, we share many key aspects supporting our social interactions and language. Marmosets evolved a similar set of features and sociocognitive skills. Among others, these include mutual gaze, enjoined action, 
turn taking, pro sociality, and a group wide platform of trust, as well as a general tendency to be in tune with others at the hormonal, communicative, and behavioral level. Marmosets also exhibit a large vocal repertoire, sophisticated forms of observational social learning, and are one of the only non-ape species to demonstrate imitation. Most of the cognitive underpinnings of pro-social behavior are likely to be a common feature of the primate brain. However, the cooperative behaviors of humans and marmosets are rare among primates, including great apes. A particularly suitable working model of human evolution can be thought of as a double legacy. On the one hand, a homologous cognitive apparatus shared with the great apes, and on the other, a set of convergently evolved motivational components resulting from a cooperative breeding system. In the hominid lineage, the adoption of extensive allomaternal care presumably resulted in more pervasive cog cognitive consequences because the motivational consequences of cooperative breeding was added to an ape level cognitive system already capable of understanding simple mental states which enabled the emergence of shared intentionality. During my obsessive exploration of marmoset behavior and the origins of language, I could notice a rapid shift in my research interests. As a nature depraved neuroscientist, my frustrations grew in response to the limits of captivity. The real complexity of the primate social and cognitive world could only be observed in nature. This is how I ended up here. Cayo Santiago. In 1938, an American primatologist named Clarence Carpenter envisioned a project unlike anything in the history of science. With his team, he shipped several hundred rhesus macaques from India to a tiny island in the Caribbean. The goal was to establish an independent monkey colony on an island devoid of humans other than scientists. The research site would become the first natural laboratory of its kind where monkeys would live their lives unrestrained, yet under strict scientific supervision. For almost a hundred years, this well-kept secret colony has provided insights into the deepest questions of our primate heritage. Studies conducted on this island explored different features of primate behavior and genetics from sociality to aging, aggression, parenting, vocal communication, political hierarchies. We share about 94% of our DNA with rhesus macaques, a similarity close enough to allow generalization without the inherently confounding human factors. After Hurricane Maria in 2017, the monkeys formed more friendships and became more tolerant of each other, despite fewer resources. In the past, the social currency determining their hierarchies was based on food resources, but now this currency changed. With fewer trees, the higher ranking individuals would get the best spots in the shade. Studies like this are invaluable as they help us understand how humans adapt to natural disasters despite fewer resources. My task on the island was to collect and to store monkey excreta, which we then used to analyze biomarkers of aging. And to do that, I had to stay very close to my targeted individuals, or as I like to call them, focals. To identify a monkey, I had to learn how to recognize its face, body, any deformities or injuries, family members, friends, enemies, and of course, their personality. Knowing a monkey is like knowing a person. But while humans tend to seek out eye contact, macaques see it as a declaration of violence. 
If you stare into the eyes of a macaque for longer than two seconds, be prepared to witness an array of stunningly demonic faces. But without direct provocation, you might find yourself becoming a victim to something I would like to call macaque side channel attacks. Certain provocateurs will spend a good amount of time studying your behavior and will often go unnoticed. You will only get to know their true intentions when the time is right. Not to say that all macaques are psychopaths, some of them are actually really nice, but one thing is certain, and that is that macaque society is violent. This society operates on strict social hierarchies. Millions of years of natural selection and behavioral machinery resulted in chaotic, yet highly effective, dominant structures. There is no mercy in macaque society, not even for infants who face equally ungodly acts of violence. As a human bystander, I could not deny my deeply rooted visceral reactions to these confusing acts of violence. But then again, who am I to judge? They have lived on this planet longer than all of us. The macaque elders don't seem to care at all though. By now they have really seen it all. These mindless bursts of aggression and dominance displays are treated as rites of passage, so to say. Some days are worse than others, however. For example, when long periods of famine strike, all hell breaks loose on Monkey Island. During World War II, the monkeys were left unfed for months which forced them to venture out into the ocean to search for alternative sources of food. Being excellent swimmers, these hungry macaques reached the shores of civilization, wreaking havoc on anything or anyone who crossed their path. Oddly enough, the descendants of these ballsy macaques still live scattered on the mainland today. One particularly alluring city vandal is the monkey of Santurce, or El Mono de Santurce, who became an internet celebrity overnight and fueled an entire rabbit hole of monkey memes. This brings me, or this brings up the interesting question of the return to monkey life. What exactly should we return to? The primate state of being seems to be idealized by extremely online anarcho-primitivists but it is based on the very assumption of an intelligence hierarchy with humans at the top. Somehow, these destructive behaviors seem to have been reached or peaked by humans, and going back is our only attempt at salvation. How would this return look like, though? As I spent every day of the summer being attacked, and eventually accepted into macaque society, I learned several valuable lessons. In order to become integrated, you have to let go of the fear of dying. You have to resist your impulse, your human impulse, to overthink and control the situation. My first instinct was to run. It didn't work. My second instinct was to ignore these attempts at provocation this also didn't work, as the monkeys then read through my fear and continued bullying me. The only thing that truly enabled me to exist in their society was to enforce my dominance, exactly the same way as them. So when a monkey would provoke me, I would provoke back. After a while, I got so used to displaying the macaque aggressive face that I actually started to even enjoy it, weirdly. The monkeys also gradually stopped bullying me and they accepted my place in their hierarchy and I respected theirs back. My continual exposure, or exposure and close interactions with macaques gradually resulted in a strange form of behavioral tuning. It allowed me to embody a fellow primate species 
which in turn enhanced my sensory and cognitive abilities. Perhaps this was a kind of literal form of return to monkey praxis, allowing a direct and deep confrontation of our primate nature. With this, I call for the need to reshift our perspective from the narrative that humans are the dominant primate shaping the history of our planet. Instead, I call for a primate plurality, acknowledging the individual respective histories of different primates and animal species, which are developed in parallel to ours. Here at Trust, I hope to explore the themes of human-animal interactions, non-human communication, and evolutionary and ethological approaches to contemporary human culture together with you. One early attempt at this is our new intelligences channel in the Discord, where we commenced the exploration of human and non-human minds alike. I would also like to explore the shitpost science format where we as a community could actively participate in developing new speculative directions and maybe alternative hypotheses to scientific research. As I said, my hope is to serve as a medium between these different realms in an effort to demystify and collectivize the study of animal behavior and cognition. Thank you. I look forward to conspiring with you. <laughs>